Hey, what's going on guys? Nate here from Hubcast. And we had a really special episode uh, recently for the Hop Up Cast where the voice of Caustic JB Blanc joined us to, well, join Nick. I wasn't there for some reason, whatever. That's you, Nick. Anyway, uh, he joined us for a special episode. Uh, Nick got to interview him and had a really good conversation with him. So typically when it comes to the video, uh, we like to give our patrons, if you follow us at... Uh, patreon.com slash threat x reproductions you can subscribe to us there typically we have these like late night editions for our uh, patreon members but because this is such a special episode we wanted to kind of get it out there everywhere that we can and let you guys see the great content that we were able to come out with so um up next nick and jb so enjoy the show maybe this hangout is live Look at that. It works. All right. Woo! <laughs> well, I'm excited. I mean, you're the first, I'd say, big name that I've had on as far as, like, actual, like, industry. I had Drifter on, which was probably the biggest, like, YouTube industry that I've had on. Um, so... And this just happens to be great because it's for Apex. So, I mean, that's that's a game that obviously for the podcast. Um, so uh, the podcast is called uh, Hubcast. So Apex Legends Hubcast, your central hub for everything Apex. Um, and so, yeah, I kind of reached out to all you guys. Um, and I think you and, you know can't remember his name off the top of my head but the guy who plays gibraltar actually got back to me relatively fast mila got back to me pretty darn fast i think she was actually one of the first because it was kind of like a shotgun blast was, <laughs> who answers <laughs> Mel- Mel- Lee. yeah yeah did i say i said it wrong didn't i sorry it's okay i'm just you know just arrogantly correcting you yes of course <laughs> no I mean, my down. american accent that's all right Alrighty. Um, so I guess we can just kind of jump into it and I can kind of do like an intro later for the, sure, for, the you know. for the audio listeners. Um, so, I mean, let's, let's start it off simple. You know, let's just get to know each other. Hi. Hi. <laughs> My name's Nick. My name's JB. <laughs> um, I, I am from Boise, Idaho. I, currently am a bus driver uh for the school district here Good you, man. and and so then i i trying to build hopefully this empire on the side um you are the voice of caustic which is the reason you're on this particular show right. um but you know we kind of want to just get to know you we want to kind of get a little bit more you know if people want more stuff they can go and watch that one video which i really like it showed all the voice actors and you know and so that was nice to put like a face to the actual um character and so um but let's let's get to know you uh where are you from originally well i was born in france my my oh, father's okay. french and my mother's english my mother was working in paris and uh, and i uh, i was born just outside paris in a place called fontenay sous bois and then my parents uh, t- turned out it didn't work out. So they divorced when I was about three, four. And my yeah. mom took me to live in England. And I grew up in, in North Yorkshire uh, because her sister was living there at the time. And a very, very beautiful rural part of England, just about halfway between London and Scotland. Oh, okay. uh, grew up almost practically on a farm or surrounded by farms. Very simple country background. Um, yeah. And loved it. Yeah. You know, uh, maybe a not so well known uh, tidbit is uh, Boise is actually from a French word. It's its original enunciation is Boise. Yeah, I think um, I might be you know Americanizing it, but Boise. I always thought that was kind of cool. Um, but of course, if you call it Boise, a lot of people will get mad at you. <laughs> yeah. Or sure. is it Boy? No, Boise. 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 Boise is the right w- way to say it. Boise. Oh, Boise. I see. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, if you put like a Z have... in there, people will like, you know, 
get their pitchforks and everything. Yeah, I got a couple of friends from Michigan, and they don't want you to call it Michigan either. Michigan. <laughs> Michigan. <laughs> well, no, you can't call it that. No, no. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, where do you live now, then? I live in Hollywood. I'm, Hollywood. I'm I live, in, I live in the Hollywood on. Hills in a little cottage. Oh, really? That's yeah. nice. Yeah, and I love it. Um, it's very handy because a lot of the studios are in Burbank. Right. Uh, and I'm directing a lot of games these days, so I have to zip all over town a lot. So uh, I'm directing all the Blizzard stuff with Andrea Toyas. That's, and that studio's 10 minutes from my house, so I like that job. Mm. Um, I also direct Fortnite Save the World and League of Legends. And so by direct, what, what do you mean by that? Like the story? I, do, I direct all the voices. Oh, interesting. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah. That's really cool. So, I, I loved Fortnite way before it became, you know, the battle royale that it is now. Like I I, I like the OG Fortnite, you know, like it's it's before, still going strong. It, it's going strong, but like in my opinion, just kind of the wrong reasons. I, I love it for what it is, and you know, people jumped on the bandwagon once the bandwagon jumped onto the other bandwagon. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny. I mean, I, you know, when I tell people I direct voices for, for they, they, all, they all know Battle Royale, but there's a whole campaign, Save the World, that's been going mm -hmm. for three years, that's been updating every 10 weeks and has great characters and great story and really fun, a fun sense of humor. Yes. And I think the powers that be at Fortnite have realized now that this is doing rather well because it's been in beta forever. <sighs> and I'm hoping that they're going to punch it out and uh, and actually do something with it because it's, it's, it's my favorite project I'm working on at the moment because it just has this fantastic, the writers are superb and it has a fantastic sense of humor, very yeah. self-deprecating, so I, I relate as a Brit. <laughs> yeah, that that's kind of funny. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I love Fortnite as far as just the, the storyline and everything and Ray, you know, just her quips and everything is hilarious and all the all the different characters. It's really fun. Um, so are you, are you married? Uh, I am happily divorced. Happily divorced. Yeah. That's I have a daughter. Um, yeah. How old? Yeah. She's 14. 14. And every inch of 14. <laughs> um, and uh, she's rapidly becoming an avid anime fan, which is terrifying, but there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. What can I tell you? Yeah. Um, she's. I think she's kind of disappointed that I don't do more anime these days. Um, oh, really? Because that's how I started out in the beginning. The first, the first project I did when I moved to LA was a was a uh, an anime series called Helsing. Oh, okay, yeah. And uh, which became a bit of a thing. Um, and I started on on various. So I kind of cut my voice over teeth on 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 anime. Oh. So I have a great fondness for it. Unfortunately, it pays a lot worse than everything else. So there's only so much of it you can do. Right. Uh, right. But I know for one that my kid is extremely disappointed that I don't do more. Well, I mean, what, what would you say is your favorite thing about being a dad? About being a dad? Oh, my mm -hmm. God. You're talking to a fellow dad here, so it's like, I yeah. got I to gotta take that angle. I know we, some of our listeners, too, they talk about how their how, parents how and their... Uh, mine's uh, just turned four Saturday, actually. Bless. So, Oh, yeah. It's so awesome. <laughs> and boy or a girl? Uh, she's a girl. Her name's yeah. Zoe Ann. You're in a lot of trouble, my friend. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, everybody always talks about the terrible twos or whatever, but I feel like she skipped over the terrible twos or she just was late to them because it's like now we're getting the the breakdowns and, and everything. It's like twos were, you know, all right. She had a couple of breakdowns, but it really wasn't that bad. But now three and four, like now that's when she just decided. It's like, you know, if I don't like it, I'm just going to sit on the floor. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, and and the only policy is to walk away and realize to make them realize that it doesn't work. But uh, <laughs> yeah, as their little personalities come out, it's uh, it's the, the father is the one who is easy, more easily manipulated. Mm. Uh, yes, and then later the mother comes into the target line, and and uh, and and daddy gets much more kind of you know. And you have to be careful when you're when you're divorced because they'll work you one against the other. <laughs> exactly quite, right. Quite cleverly. Believe <laughs> <laughs> you're married to. Uh, but it's easier for them to do it if you're divorced. But they live in town. I see a lot of her, and and we have a, a fantastic relationship. And I'm just deeply, deeply proud of her. Yeah. She's an amazing kid, super sharp. Nice. And um, and we, I, the the sense of humor that we've now grown to share is my favorite thing right now because you know she knows it, it's the the English have a fairly acerbic wit. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. And you can, you can, as an Englishman, you, you you can insult someone without them being quite sure whether you've insulted them or not. True. And, uh, she's gotten onto that very quickly, and I, I, that, <laughs> that makes me very happy growing up in America because it's there's not a lot of uh, you know 
irony and cynicism here sometimes. So it's great to see that she's caught that from me at least. Right, right. I mean, yeah. Thankfully, just... she got a mother's look, so that's that we're okay there. <laughs> oh man, that that's yeah, that's that's nice. I mean, uh, British people do have like a, a certain sense of humor, and it's like as an American, it can be kind of hard to jump on. But like one of my favorite, you know, film creators of all time is Edgar Wright. And one of my favorite movies of all time is Shaun of the Dead. And sometimes just like, you know, some of the background stuff, some of the stuff that you're really not paying attention to. Like one of the funniest parts in that movie is when he's chewing down on the peanuts and he's trying to be quiet about it. And just like his mannerisms and, and the faces that Simon Pegg makes, it's just like, it's just hilarious. He's you know? a very, very, very funny man. If you, if you never, there was an original, oh God, what was it called? The series that put Simon Pegg on the map um, was spaced. a Channel Four series. Sorry, spaced, spaced, and and it's just fine, fine, fine comedic work and very yeah. off the wall and super funny. Yeah, really good. I like that one. Um, so, what would you say was like your very first job? Not necessarily in the industry, just like in general. Oh, my first ever job, God, I was 16, <laughs> and I worked in, in England, up and down the motorways of England, there were these really shitty little cafes, uh, like roadside rest stops, uh, called The Little Chef, and they were, they, were, they were basically, it was, I guess, as close to a kind of roadhouse diner, I guess, as you get in, in the American equivalent. Oh, okay. Um, not necessarily known for their quality or, or for that matter hygiene oh geez um, but i think i was making like a pound an hour oh, and uh, wow. and i needed a job because you know my parents and i respect them for this never really handed me anything it was mm. it was you know you want something you go and earn it which taught me a work ethic very very early and uh i was uh, at one point i was the only boy working there or the only male working there and we had to wear the silly little paper hats and the uniform with the epaulets in fact that was an upgrade we go and we go <laughs> Halfway through my time working there, we got an upgrade and got fancy epaulettes on our shirts, and I had to wear these dreadful kind of nylony kind of red pants and oh and really a bit paper hat. <laughs> and they'd always make me clean the toilets and or clean out the meat fridge and uh, the freezer and stuff, and you'd just find just terrible things in there. You'd just be like, God. And I remember the the ladies locked me in the freezer, the walk-in freezer, once, thinking that mm -hmm. was hilarious. So um, I'm, I'm not going to say it was a fond memory, but that was my first gig, and it was basically to get me through until I was the right age to pull pints in a bar because that was much more fun and, and a much better job. And I, I grew up in this tiny village of maybe four or five hundred people, mm -hmm. but in typical in typical fashion uh, in England, there were two pubs, mm. um, and uh, I uh, I think I worked both of them at one time or another. Oh, um, right. Yeah. But uh, but that was that was the kind of that was the, even even weight staffing in that in that environment was was uh, you know nothing like it is today where you have to kind of you know do training and stuff. That was like there was no training, <laughs> right? Steak and chips, and you can like it a lump it. <laughs> 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 but uh, yeah, so those those were my first little jobs, and of course as an actor, you know, I was a theatre actor. That's that's how I started out, and to some degree, that's that's the reason I've had the career I've had. But I, I did a lot of stupid jobs, like right. you know, while I was resting, as they used to call it, rather patronizingly. They never so, used to say you were out of work as an actor. They'd say you were resting between projects. Resting, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, like, is acting pretty much what you've always wanted to do? Sure. I mean, pretty young. <laughs> I, I didn't really know what I, yeah, I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but... um. I went to it's it's an interesting story because I was I was sort of put my mom we never had any money but my mom inherited some money and decided to put me in a private education hmm. and um which I you know eternally grateful to her for um and um they're funny they're very they're kind of very right wing institutions old school right wing institutions but they have these little revolutionary English teachers or music teachers who are in there who've just kind of given up on the public system and decided to go private and sell their souls, but they still have their little political um, agenda going on. So you get, you get kind of nice because you get a kind of, you get rounded politics in, a, in an otherwise very kind of conservative environment. Interesting. And um, I can't remember how, I was a singer. I sang in choirs a lot. Um, and, and I did some school plays uh, at my, preparatory school which was when it was from seven to 13 
And I just liked being, I liked it. I enjoyed being someone else. I mean, there's a kind of sad truism about actors, which is, I had, a, I, had a, I had a tough situation at home that was very difficult, and I think there's a there's a sad truism that that people become actors because they're not terribly happy being themselves, and it's slightly sad, but it is slightly true. I think a lot of actors, a lot of actors are mistaken for being extremely confident, and actually they're not. They're just very good at talking and, and using language. And I mean, I'm fine doing anything as a character, but ask me to read at your wedding, and I'll probably fall apart. <laughs> um, it's true. Um, but but there was a, an English teacher there who said, you know, I think you might be you might be good at this. You might want to do this as a career. Mm. And I sort of looked at him like he just walked off the panic Zarboth and said, "You can do that <laughs> for a living? Yeah, <laughs> sure you can. You can. You're not going to work, and you're probably going to die of starvation. But you can do it." He <laughs> <laughs> um, said he wasn't far from the well, wasn't far from the truth. So he suggested that I join this thing called the National Youth Theatre in 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 England. Uh, that was a program that they they did in London. It's a fantastic program. And I was 16, I think, and I I got an audition and travelled to Manchester to audition, and then went down to London to do the course. And it was like a, a month long course or something. And it was taken by a, a working actor. And you just uh, they chose a, a piece and you kind of worked on it and you did lots of physical theatre and and running around and warm ups and all this kind of stuff and. Um, I sort of asked the, the actor, uh, w w tell me what drama school's like. And he said, it's like this. And I thought, well, I've got to do that then. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I, I went home and I'd sort of left all my university applications kind of a little fallow. And uh, and I started, we started calling drama schools and they'd all finished auditioning for the year. Oh, yeah. And so I was very miserable, very depressed, thinking, shit, that's my dream of being an actor gone. Mm. And uh, I got a phone call, and they, 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 uh, the uh, the the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art had a cancellation on the last day of auditions. It was that close. Wow! And um and I went down, and I got through to the first round, and the second round, and the third round, and the fourth, and they gave me a place. So I kind of fluked my way in, uh, yeah. and suddenly I was at you know one of the most important drama schools in the world, really not knowing my ass from my elbow, as we say. Right. In I was probably too young. I think you need a little more life experience to get, you know, acting is about life experience. And so you sort of need that. But I had some of the best training I could ever have imagined having and, and working on all aspects of the business. And it was also a very strict environment. You clocked on in the morning and if you were late, you were in deep trouble. You could get thrown off the course for being late. Interesting. Um, so it was, it was an extremely disciplined environment. And because theater is a very disciplined environment. Right. What I didn't have was any on-camera training or any other, uh, you know, there was very little of that style of things. It was very much geared towards uh, a theatre training. I and mean, actually, the school itself was just in George Bernard Shaw's house, who oh, uh, donated his house 100 years before to the, to the Royal Academy. Interesting. And so we were all kind of crammed in there together. There were like 75 students, 25 a year. So just very, very small. Yeah. Uh, now it's all changed. They got a lottery grant, go grant and bought the street next door practically, and yeah, and they've expanded a lot. And they now do degree courses and stuff, which we it was never that fancy. It was a sort of vocational diploma course, uh, but but an experience that you can't really reproduce anywhere else. It was extraordinary. Yeah, I mean, what would you say was like the real moment that made you decide, like, okay, you know, it went from maybe you know, just something you wanted to do to that true passion of what you wanted to do. You know, I think it's, it's, it's very trendy and fashionable to say, well, I just, I just kind of fell into it. I don't know. It just happened. Uh, but I, I did a play, we did a play at the school with this amazing, amazing teacher and director called Stuart Manger, who mm -hmm. I'll always, always be incredibly grateful to. And it was the zoo story by Edward Albee. It's a very simple two handed play uh, with a park bench, some leaves, and it's set in central park. And it's about a guy who seems very troubled and a, and a, a, a kind of uh, kind of street guy who seems a little troubled, but is very uh -huh. smart. And then this very kind of straight-laced businessman and the relationship that they build. And spoiler alert, it turns out that he wants to use him in a sissy's suicide. So he sort of runs onto it. He riles him up to an extent where he he has a knife and they oh, get geez. the other guy to pull it off him. And he gets he sort of stabs himself with the other guy's hand. Um and it's it's Edward Albee. It's like theater of the absurd, and it's but it's a brilliant piece. And mm -hmm. there were all these, you know, people used to come to these plays because they 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 did like them. And and it was when the sort of the big meaty sporting jocks would come up to me and kind of go, uh, uh, um, I don't know. Uh, that was it was really uh, it was it was really good. And mm -hmm. and I thought, well, if I can 
affect that kind of emotional or response in them for right them, that's a gigantic emotion um, <laughs> Then, then there must be something in this. There's a power in this. There's a power in this form of, stereo, of storytelling that I may have an aptitude for, right. talent for. And so that kind of switched the button for me. And I, I was like, okay, I think this is really what I... what I, And I've been longing to find something. And you know, like a lot of actors, I was the oddball kid. I was bullied at school. I was a kid that was French originally, which you didn't want to be in the 70s and 80s. You were different. You didn't, you know, it's, you remember when you were at school, you'd do anything not to be different. Yeah. Um, and you know, I was very different, and so there was a lot of. Uh, I, I got I got bullied at school, and I I, I started using humor to get myself out of trouble. Right. But the the first time I I and impressions and stuff like that, and that's how I started the voice thing, I guess. But the first time I ever felt comfortable was when I walked on stage. You know, I felt at home there. I felt, and not for the reasons that you think. Not because, yeah, okay, the praise is nice. The yeah, right. Is nice. But the actual work and the storytelling and seeing the effect that it had on people, that's what that's what changed my mind. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, entertaining or entertainment really isn't necessarily about the praise or anything like that. It really is just about the craft of it. It is, you know, you, you go into a different mindset, you know, and it's like yeah, yeah. when I was in high school, I also did a choir. I did a jazz choir and uh, regular acapella choir and everything and you know like I, I got some of the solos but it wasn't really just the fact that i got the solos it was just like singing you know because it's a, it's a certain feeling you get like even if you're just like singing in the shower or belting it out in the car or whatever it's it's just that feeling you know you're not entertaining anybody but you're still putting your all into it and so it's just you know it is sort of euphoric in some ways like especially when you do get the proper reaction or you just know in your own self that yeah i did my best yeah you know and you know that's, that's, that's part of the reason i think i started doing this you know um so backstory for for anybody who hasn't heard this yet from our audience you know the the main reason i actually just started doing this was because of my daughter i found out she was existed <laughs> found out hey we're pregnant that and happens. had had that moment where it's like what am i gonna do with my life you know at the time i think i had just gotten done with uh my schooling as a cma and so that's a certified medical assistant and so i'm like i don't want to fucking do this <laughs> like ooh, let me i mean the one thing i was the worst at was phlebotomy it's like sometimes i'd get the vein and sometimes i wouldn't get the vein well you gotta really be dig digging around in people's no, arms like, I'll, no. I'll get there in a minute don't worry <laughs> and and there was just certain things where it's like i i caught on right off the bat like math i'm really good at so it's like numbers i was really good at and it's just certain things i caught on really fast and i think right around the same time was also when like commentary it was really starting to pick up and so it's like it kind of inspired me and it's like I'm, i want to take something i'm good at something that you know that i actually want to do and that was kind of entertain people and so it kind of just fell into this or whatever and so you know as far as that kind of passion you know i can kind of at least to a certain extent i mean you're you're obviously probably a lot further along than i am <laughs> But I mean, it's definitely interesting. It is a competition between us. So that, Obviously, that that's why I had you on. Hello. I'm directly competing with you. <laughs> <laughs> now, I mean, the other aspect that I'd like to bring to it is that is that I've always been the team player. I've always wanted to be part of a team, and yeah, I enjoy that aspect. And and the collaboration of you know of a choir or or, uh, or certainly a play. I mean, you get really really close to those people for a period of oh yeah, maybe six weeks or six months. You know, I, I did. I did a lot of theater. I had a theater company, and I and we did a lot of tours. And you're on tour with these people for three months. It's a, it's very intensive. And I was part of the National Theater Company in London for for three and a half years. And and you know, very very much feeding a part of a team. The one thing I I mourn about voiceover is that it's a very solo activity <laughs> most of the time, yeah. unless you're group recording on animation, you're on your own. And so when I started directing, the first thing I directed was a game called Shadow of Mordor. Oh, 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 oh. voices for those. Um, 
I was back on the team again. And it felt like, you know, this was a collaboration. And it's a collaboration. Right. And when I'm directing, it's a collaboration with the producers and writers that are either on the phone or in the booth with us, in the in, mm -hmm. the, in the studio with us, and the actor and me and the engineer who is, has every right to an opinion as much as anyone else because they hear more voices than anyone else. Right. Um, and I... I the, the the aspect of, of working as a team and Blizzard are really big on that and and you know really inclusive in the way that we work with actors and I've learned a lot from Andrea Toyas about how how that really does improve uh, the storytelling and that's really what it's all right. about. Actors are just vessels for words. Um, they do what they can with the words that they're given, and um, and that teamwork aspect I think is is something that is, I, I've really enjoyed rediscovering as a as a director rather than just being solely a performer. That's awesome. Great. Yeah, yeah, that great. is definitely one thing you miss when you when you get away from it, whether it is in, on a production or choir, like you were saying, you know, is a team, you know, and that's kind of, I've always wanted to stay on a team. I've wanted to be a part of a team. I've never like thought to myself, Oh, I'm going to sit in front of a computer and play video games for a living. Even though, you know, sometimes that might be what I do. It's like, that's never been my dream. I've never wanted to just be like, Oh, let me get paid for this. <laughs> no, it, it's, it's really has always been like a team effort as far as like, let's make something together. Yes. And like, sometimes, you know, there are plenty of people out there that can do it by themselves. And, you know, I definitely not that I don't have the charisma and I couldn't like carry on like a one man show or whatever, but what's the fun in that? Yeah. You know, the funnest thing is to, is to bounce off of each other. You know, some of my like funniest jokes can be when I'm like joking around with my friends, you so, know, whereas like if I'm sitting near a pad and I try to make a joke, it's like Donkey Kong. Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I, I also just think that, you know, society's changed since when I was a kid. When I was a kid, mm -hmm. and this was a long time ago because I'm 50 years old oh, my um, goodness. this year. Uh, I uh, community was a really big thing. Even if you, if my friends who lived in cities, their neighborhoods, they knew their neighbors. They knew they they inter, they they exchanged ideas and um, and I think we we we've lost a bit of that as we have become more isolated and separated. Is that a kid visit you're leaning across to see? Yeah, yeah. My my three year old's watching something right now, so it's like <laughs> I heard a noise. I'm like, my daddy ears are tingling. Yeah, I get you. <laughs> um, you know that uh, that. Uh, it's my it's my criticism of the world again is that is that the, the, we've lost critical thinking when i was educated it was it was question everything question that politician question religion question um entertainers question interviews question mm -hmm. you know f find out about the world, question situations and now we're just sort of fed stuff and we have to believe it and and you yeah. either watch fox news or you watch msnbc or you watch cnn and you're you 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 eat the crap they feed you right and i think we've lost that ability to to sort of question anything and i just think you know, acting is is the study of human behavior and and True. getting in there and, and understanding characters through empathy. You have to empathize with a character to play a character. You've got to lose all your shit and right. bring their shit into you. And and that actually requires what people don't expect. People think actors are very arrogant. They're actually very humble. They have to be to to get inside a character. Just because you're good, you've got the gift of the gab doesn't mean you're the most confident person in the world. Right. You know, and so that's part of it too is the, is the in in the terms of the sense of community and the exchange of of healthy criticism and ideas and I, i'm all for that i love it yeah well let's take a quick look at your career one thing that popped yeah. up um you you were actually in probably one of my favorite movies like at least i guess swashbuckling oh is this swashbuckling anyways count them oh, i suspect i know where this is going Count of Monte Cristo. The Count of Monte Cristo, yeah. Yes. Yeah, that was oh, that's that's one of my favorite movies. And it's like, and it, no offense to you, <laughs> but it's like I saw you and I'm like, oh, that guy. <laughs> I don't find that offensive at all. That's great. <laughs> no, uh, but yeah, that's one of my favorite. And then you're in Breaking Bad, Better Call Saul, War Dogs. Uh, more recently, you were Kano in Mortal Kombat 11. Uh, yeah. Uh, what were you in Death or Love, Death, and Robots? Because I absolutely love that series. Uh, I did some tiny bits. I auditioned for a lot of stuff in that and, and was given pieces, but there you go. That's the way it sometimes goes. Um, mm -hmm. There's a, 
I can't remember. Do you know, I can't even remember. Do you know the episode name? It's, uh, I play like a station master or a, a, a kid who's working in a steam engine. And, oh, really? and I'm like, I, I'm the I'm the guard that, that's, or kind of the guy that's running him. And then I do a couple of other things. <laughs> Just small stuff. I can't, I can't remember. But, but I watched the series and I thought it was absolutely awesome. Oh, my really gosh. good. Just really good. Really, Great I mean, there, there was probably not a single episode that I found like boring i i there's one there's one it was the one with the astronaut and she rips off her arm to to yeah. get herself that one was slightly boring but it was still like visually you know they were all enticing enough yeah, yeah, yeah. different and for different reasons different elements and lots of mm -hmm. different you know different animation media brought together which i just thought was was fantastic it's right a great idea even just like different storytelling the the funniest one was the yogurt one <laughs> they become sentient and then take over the world and then leave us and yoga yeah. power man <laughs> right up there with wakanda <laughs> um so then we also you were in uh metro yeah exodus exodus uh dark siders 3 and i mean yeah. that's not even counting like some of the other um some of the other like uh video games what's judge eyes shinyu no yo Gone. That's a big Japanese detective game that's coming out. Uh, oh. Yeah, I'm surprised they publicized that so early. But yeah, the, it's got, I don't know. I'm not sure when it's coming out, but sometime in the next. Uh, I guess you were you were money bags in the reignited trilogy. I was indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Isn't it? It's a village, man. You have to do all kinds of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, again, you see, that's Spyro is a really hugely loved brand. You've got to be really careful. It's 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 kind of scary when you take over stuff like like Doom Kano in MK11. I know Michael McConaughey. I don't know why he was replaced. Uh, I don't know why I got chosen to replace him. They did something different with the character. Mm -hmm. Michael's been a phone for years. Um, but it's you know these are the things that that happen is you, you, you but it's a it's a it's an awesome responsibility to take on a character that's been going for a long time right um and throw your kind of take on it um and you can take a lot of shit for doing that let me tell you oh yeah trolls love it um what well, well i mean out of all, all everything so far like what has been your what has been your favorite yeah always that question Right? I mean, it, you have to at one point. Listen, the Count of Monte Cristo brought me to America. And um, I was in a pharmacy yesterday, and a guy came up and went, Ah, Luigi Vampa, yes? Ah, yes, Luigi Vampa. <laughs> I know, I see you, I see you, this big Armenian guy. Oh, I could see you straight away. I could tell it was you, huh? What you are doing in this place, yeah? What you are doing? And, um, <laughs> and it's very flattering. It's lovely. I mean, I got spotted in a ski mask on a ski lift in Mammoth once. And I just, I kind of go, dude, well done, man, because <laughs> I would never have remembered me. <laughs> and uh, people, people really, really love that film. And I think I was kind of lucky because, you know, there's a long sequence where they're in prison together. And then suddenly halfway through the movie, this new character pops up who's kind of jovial and Italian and everyone kind of wakes up and goes, oh, a new guy. Great. Um, <laughs> so I think I kind of got lucky. Yeah, uh, but 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 that was the reason, you know, Kevin Reynolds, the director of the film, said to me, I think you do well in Los Angeles. You should come and have a look, come and stay and, and have a look around and see what you think. And I did. And I went home and I sold what little I had and, and came out here with nothing <laughs> um, and had to start from scratch because I'd only really done theater. And people, you know, casting directors would be like, so theater, how does that work? <laughs> like, Okay, and nowadays they they get that the good theater training really does you know help you help you be a better storyteller. Hopefully, well, but, would you uh, say that the British people had a more understanding of that? Because I would I would imagine. I mean, that's where most of the real prestigious yeah, words, right? You can do it. Yeah, no, <laughs> you can. Prestigious schools were yeah. are either in London or just over in Europe, whereas over here in America, you know, like what, what's a prestigious school here for acting? I do honestly, you know uh, yeah, NYU, that's a good point. Yes, that's a good uh, point. Carnegie Mellon is. But Juilliard in, has a very uh, French name. <laughs> Juilliard. Juilliard. Um, everything fancy has a French name. You know that. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, there are lots of great schools. Here. Uh, uh, Arda here in the, in the American Academy of Music and Dramatic Art, or AMDA, is it AMDA or AMDA or AMDA? Uh, that's very prestigious. Um, Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh is one of the best schools in the world. I think. Um, I have a whole theory about this because I've been an acting coach uh, uh, in my past too. Um, in England, there's a very uh, there's a very strong technical foundation. It's 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 a sort of belief system that, or it was in, back in the day, 
that back in my day, back in my day, <laughs> um, that, that with that technical, strong technical foundation, so really learning how to because acting is breath, emotion is breath, and really learning how to breathe sounds simple, but it, learning how to breathe properly, um, learning things like uh, rest techniques, like Alexander technique, learning to fight with swords, learning to sing, learning to dance, learning to move, learning to improvise. Learn, it's very there's a lot of technical stuff going on there. And that's it, the approach is that that provides the foundation of which you do your emotional work, but you've always got that rock solid foundation to fall back on. It's complicated to explain. America, I think, for many years. For some, yes, but I'm the, right on board. <laughs> you are. Uh, the sort of Strasbourgian approach of, of, um, of method acting was more based on uh, emotional content. And I think, you know, what became important in America was an emotional training. And, and and there was and England got kind of seen as the place to go for a technical training. I've always believed that the two should merge. I think they work right. best together when they merge together. Um, so I think I think the reason that these Brit and Australian actors work so well over here is because that that the technical training is really really strong, and there are very few American actors who've actually been uh, fortunate enough to have that kind of a training here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and the other thing is that, it, you know, we grow up hearing an American accent all our lives. Now, it, it, it can be done to a greater or lesser extent, but just, I was a dialect coach for 10 years as well, just just physically, a Brit is relaxing down into an American accent, whereas uh, for Americans to do British, they have to reach up and do muscle, use muscles that they don't usually good have point. to use. That's a real good point. Well, I was we saying, hear, that, you let's know, hear your American accent. I'm really going to do the performing puppy thing? Um, <laughs> oh, oh. Oh, and stands oh, oh. for me. So if you think of a, an Ameri a British accent has an egg on its end at the back of your mouth. So you're saying back, out, mark, call. They're all very soft palatey and very up and down. Mm -hmm. And if you take that egg and you turn it on its side, you get this much flatter kind of approach and you become much more American. And that changes as you go further west so that by the time you get to Malibu, man, it's too hot and going to the beach. There's just nothing going on. There's no space in the mouth. Um, in New York, it's a little more hard. It's a little the, the climate's a little different. It's too cold. Let's get some coffee. I got to get out of here. Um, uh, and and you know a lot of Brits make the mistake of they either do this kind of goomba, fucking what the fuck am I going to you doing? That kind of very New Yorky thing, or they kind of do this weird kind of cowboy, yeah. kind of strange Texas hybrid, which is which is really kind of also wrong. So you you I think every British actor who arrives in LA, and I used to train a lot of them was it, it, your first thing you've got to do is get that American accent right because you're going to ask you're going to be asked to do it no matter what and I, right. I'm proud that I've, I've been able to do a lot of a lot of American roles on TV um, and my first gig uh, was my first TV gig in, in LA was in LA ironically was NYPD NYPD blue which is as New Yorker show as you can imagine shot in LA um, and I had to play this Greek guy from Brooklyn and uh, I figured if I fooled them I was going to get away with it and right. I have so far, but I'm expecting the knock on the door to tell me I'm a fraud any second. <laughs> it never comes on the door anymore. It just comes online. Right, exactly. Yeah. On the yeah, ritual sphere. assassination online is something I'm used to. <laughs> <laughs> you can't please all of the people all of the time. Well, I mean, what what would you think, say was like the biggest like F you that somebody's given you? Oh, that would have been back, back in drama school when I was really shocking, shocking, shocking actor. Um, there's some nice, I mean, there's some pretty good stuff around uh, about Kano right now because a lot of people are very loyal to the old, you know, the old, the old voice, and, and it's hard uh -huh. taking that from the new. What is nice about Kano is that apparently he's become this giant gay icon, <laughs> which I think is hilarious. Something to do with the leather chaps and the bare chest and. All of that and his extreme uh, masculinity, to almost toxic masculinity, which I think appeals. Um, but no, I mean, you know, yeah, I, I, uh, you'll forgive me if I don't memorize the bad reviews. Oh they, yeah, I know. those I let go. <laughs> you, you have to, but every once in a while, one will just like stick out as far as like. Yeah, I've been, I've been, I've been very lucky. I have to say, I've, people have been very kind about my work, and I, I don't attribute that to any kind of prowess on my part. But, but I think, um, on the whole, people have been, people have been very generous. You know, you're never going to keep everyone happy, and I'm fine with that. You need a tough skin to do this for a living. Yeah. Um. So, I mean, what was your first voice acting job? You said you were in anime, correct? So, was that Van was Helsing? My first gig. 
Yeah, it was Helsing was my first. I didn't do much voiceover in the UK either. I did. I'd done some like corporate medicals back when they were called CD ROMs, <laughs> um, way back in the day, children. What's that? Um, yeah, I mean, when you, when I started doing voiceover, they, they, they were splicing <laughs> tape. <laughs> it was we were splicing tape in caves. Um, <laughs> Uh, but Hels Helsing was my first gig, and Talis and Jaffe, who's part of the Critical Role crew, and all those guys, they, all that Critical Role crew are some of my oldest friends, because we all kind of came to town at the same time, some of them from Texas, um, some of them already here. Um, so the Troy Bakers and the Travis Williams and Laura Baileys and Talison and all those folks, are, are Liam O'Brien, I've known them for a long, 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 long time. Mm -hmm. So it's great to see how we've all kind of come through the business together. It's... it's um, I regard success as I'm still here, <laughs> you know, as long as we're still pumping them out. Uh, and I couldn't be prouder of those guys and what they've done with Critical Role because that has exploded in a way that's that's kind of amazing. Yeah. But Tannison Jaffe, he directed that that first dub of Helsing. Really? And so that was my first. That was, and then I think Sam Regal directed the next thing I did, and uh, it just kind of picked up. They asked me to direct a, a, a dub. Which is a very odd Japanese series called LR Licensed by Royal, which is beautifully Japanese in the way that it doesn't make any sense in English as a title. Um, and I, yeah, we had to kind of we had to retranslate back into Japanese the ending to try and figure out what the hell was going on so that we could finish it. I seem to remember, um, but it turned out as a good dub, so I was happy. Um, and then I think my first video game. Was either SOCOM, US Navy SEALs, or Old Republic, or I mean, you know, I've done, I'm told over 200 games now, so it's hard to remember, but, uh, or, wow. or James Bond from Russia with Love. That was another one that was, yeah. that was early as well. And that we did face cap where you, you, we did the 72 balls on your face. Pardon the expression. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that was that was that was you know that was at the very beginning of any kind of facial capture technology that was going on. Right. So those I were mean, my first sort of game, game gigs. So SOCOM, you were probably like, were you just like a henchman or were you like? No, oh, I was a, I was a, a, a sergeant, a Northern Irish sergeant um, hmm. called Aidan O'Rourke. I remember, hmm. and he was uh, you know it was a lot of get down, grenade. <laughs> <laughs> You don't pull your shit together, bro. I'm sending you home. <laughs> a lot of that kind of stuff. It was directed by Chris Zimmerman. She gave me an early early game break. So, <laughs> yeah, that's all I remember about that. And then, the, I, for some reason, games seem to be my niche, and it just it kind of it just kind of self fulfilled. It just kept going. Yeah. So, would you say you prefer video games over anime? No. I mean, over anime, probably. Yeah, anime, anime is anime's hard work for very little money. It just is. Uh -huh. It's a great place to cut your teeth. Um, if there's a project that I thought was, and there have been projects that have come up that I really loved, and like Monster was one. Um, Persona, I've been involved in that franchise. That's that's interesting stuff. Right. Um, whether that really qualifies as anime, I, I don't think so. But but uh, but it was early stuff. And weird stuff like I My Me Strawberry Eggs. What, uh, where do you come up with a title like that? Um, uh, so, and I, but then of course, I did Naruto for 15 years and Bleach for about the same amount of time. Oh, I did sure. both Naruto and Bleach, which were ongoing series. Uh, and we only just, you know, in only the last couple of years, those have ended. So I was, I was still doing those, just keeping my hand in, but I've never really major, major characters. Uh, it's mm -hmm. tough with anime because, it, you know, uh, it pays very little compared to other other work that we do, but then I started moving more into animation, and animation I really really enjoy because again it's that collaborative thing. Often you get to group record, right. so you're recording with. You know, I did a series called All Hail King Julian. Um, Who'd you play uh, on that? Huh? Who'd you play on? Jeff? I played loads of different things on that. Oh yeah. Um, but uh, principally, Josh, Josh, the the mud spewing monster that becomes the kind of guru. <laughs> Who vomits <laughs> vomits mud from his eyes and his mouth? Oh, that's why. And then becomes this kind of sensei. Um, and then and then I you know I did Benson and the mountain lemurs and lemur captains and all kinds of different stuff, which is a super fun show and just a hell of a room because you had Kevin Michael Richardson and Jeff Bennett and Danny Jacobs and you know the extraordinary people like you know Welker would come in a guest or or Mola Marsh, you know. 
Um, so when you're recording those, you say you do it as a group. So like you like just stand on different sides of the room and they have a line of microphones and a oh, line nice. of chairs and a line of music stands. And oh, the okay. poor engineer is is trying to ride the sliders. So he's he's trying to put you up before you speak and take you down when you're not speaking at the same time. It's really quite impressive. Mm -hmm. Um, so that the mics don't bleed over each other. Of but course, yeah. The vibe you get between the actors and the sharpness and the humor, and those guys, they improvise a lot. So a lot of, a lot of stuff, you know, kind of comes out of that improvisation. Mm -hmm. um, and so you you kind of, you really need to be in the same room to, to get that kind of vibe. And, you know, not all shows do it. I did a show called Dragon's Race to the Edge, um, and that was recorded individually, uh, which is trickier. Um, I've done a lot of the Telltale games, and those those are recorded individually by and large. Which you know, there's a lot of scenes and exchanges in that, which would be nice if we could all record together. I think the problem is, you know, it's hard to schedule everyone sometimes. Yeah, um, getting everyone together in a room, um, but it does have its advantages. You know, it, it, you do get you do get a kind of closer relationship between the characters. I think. Nice. I mean, I think that one of the coolest things about at least voice acting in general is I feel like the more, the more coverage that is being into like the making of, of series and, and games and everything, people are becoming a lot more aware of people like you or, you know, Troy Bakers and the Nolan Norse, you know, they're kind of like the Kings of voiceovers or whatever, but you know, it's just becoming a lot more, I guess, taken seriously. And so, I mean, you have like your unions and you have everything. So it's just, it's, it's being taken a lot more serious, which is just really good because, you know, when you do work, you get paid for it. It's a weird conception. And, you know, some <laughs> countries seem to, you know, take it with stride, but I mean, it is, it is so nice. It is so nice that we're getting to that point now where you can, you can do a job and it can yeah. get you get you what you think you deserve you know <laughs> yeah i mean listen, you know we ain't digging ditches and i and i have far more respect for people that do uh, i've done you know a lot of construction work in my time when i was in between jobs as an actor uh, it's tough as hell um I, but i do think that there's been a history of people just thinking you walk into a booth and talk and and it's very very different from that yeah and most people when they think they want to have a go and sometimes you know we'll throw someone in the booth and they just, or one of the producers says, oh, I can do that voice. Or, or one of the writers says, oh, I'll knock that out. Don't worry, I'll, I'll take care of that. And, you, and, and, uh, and they quickly realize this, there's a lot more to it. And you yeah. know, if you do a good game session, you walk out of that four hours completely exhausted. The one of my pet hates, um, and it, make, it makes me crazy, is when I'm being interviewed for some, and you haven't fallen into this pit yet. Don't. Yay! Um, <laughs> But I'll be interviewed for some for some show, and and they'll say, "Do you do, tell me? Do, do you do any? Do you ever do any real acting?" And I'm like, "Yeah, uh, okay. <laughs> you have misunderstood the concepts of what performance is." Right. I will I will happily tell you that voice acting is much more difficult than any of the on camera stuff I've ever done. Oh yeah, um, I bet. You're, you're stripped down to just your voice. You have to smile with your voice, emote with your voice. You have to frown with your voice. You have to. It's a whole different game, and it's just as physically demanding. Uh, because you put a lot of physicality into your roles when you're playing. Mm -hmm. um, the level of focus and the level of attention, you know, I always say that the more senses you strip away, the more you focus on the sense that remains. So if you're just working in audio, that that camera, that, that microphone is much more revealing than a camera because you're totally naked vocally and, and yeah. better than being naked physically, particularly if you look like me. Um, but but uh, it's just focused on the voice and, and therefore any bullshit is really quickly exposed. Any anytime it sounds, it can sound fake very easily if you're not paying uh -huh. attention. And um, and I think that you know, I I've, I've regularly done three game sessions in a day, three or four game sessions in a day, and you are beaten at the end uh -huh. of it. And yeah, you never side. see somebody in a in a booth and they're standing still. If they no. if they do, it's like you're Matthew McConaughey, and he's just like, man, yeah, yeah. All right, <laughs> that's a beautiful thing. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, it it is it is it's physically very. I mean, you know, one of my biggest competitors and my very very best friends is a a young chap by the name of Fred Tattershaw, who's been around a lot and done a lot of work. Um, you see Fred work in the booth, man. He's on it. 
you know, and, he, mm-hmm. and he's pouring with sweat afterwards, and and so am I. I mean, it's 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 tough. It's the same. The same is true as voice, voice direction. I don't think anyone really understands what it is. They don't know what you're doing mm-hmm. um, until they experience it. Until they sit in the booth and they realize just how much work goes into every single line to get it right. And you know, right. if the actor's not grabbing it, you'll be doing 15, 20 takes. Um, and and uh, there's a like like a lot of things. There's a lot more work goes into it than than meets the eye. But I think you know part of the problem when we had this strike uh, last year with the voice actors strike was that the companies then genuinely thought that's what you did. You walk into a booth oh, and right. you talk, and that's easy, and, and therefore you shouldn't be compensated for it. And uh, thankfully, and I'll always always be eternally grateful for this. The fans came out in force and said no. I don't care if Kiefer Sutherland's in a game. I care if the voice is good, and I want the voice actor to be good. And yes, I do buy certain games because I know a voice actor is going to be in it. I do buy certain properties because of that. They do have a fan base and a following, and and it matters to us. And for that, uh, the, that support that we got from the fans on that was was unbelievable and 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 very humbling. And it saved us because um, they were going to strip away a lot of the stuff that we've worked so hard to achieve right. for voice acting over the years. Yeah, it's it, it's just something that you know when when you don't know a lot about it when you when you when you just kind of you hear a voice on a video game you know it's so easy for somebody who's looking at numbers and it's like oh well this made this much money so yeah. let's just do that again you know and it's like that's why I like I like companies like uh, I mean Naughty Dog's a really good one I mean just seeing what they do and like they get you in the suits and they actually have the microphones on you, you know, like seeing them actually acting out the scene and Hey, that's actually Nolan North acting out the scene, you know, yeah. and I've done things it with like Nolan that. North on an uncharted game on several uncharted games. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and, and it is amazing. And, and, you know, Amy Hennig is a, is a good friend of mine and Amy really reinvented storytelling in video games and, and and the narrative style that Naughty Dog kind of managed to come up with with those with those games was kind of at the time unique and and extremely special yeah. and she broke story down to a very very visceral naked bare level and and rebuilt it as a game and that was a stroke of genius uh, yeah. that we'll never see again in terms of in terms of how to approach narrative in a video game and and it set the path for so many pieces of work afterwards, yeah. um, and and that's again the irony of doing that that performance capture stuff is that it's it really it demands the same skills that theatre does. Mm. So you have it's kind of fascinating that the, you have this art that's as ancient as the ancient Greeks uh, in theatre, and this art form that's as new as a newborn baby that was just born then, and constantly developing. Um, those the ancient skills are what make you good at that stuff because uh, right. it's physicality, it's inhabiting a character physically. It's you're in a space where, okay, that's a box, but actually you're up on a ridge and there's a yellow cross down there, and you've got to play to Nolan. He's that yellow cross, and Nolan is going to stand on the floor and he's going to play to that white cross where we've put 18 feet up in the air there. And you guys are going to do the scene like that. Now, it takes a lot of imagination, right? <laughs> you know, while you're holding a you know a rocket grenade launcher and uh, and and saying, Mister Mister Drake, we must stop meeting like this. <laughs> um, it, it, you know, it's weird, but it it requires all those theatre skills, and so uh, the world has, you know, it keeps coming back around. Yeah, it's fun, man. Yeah. Uh, so, out of all the games you actually are a part of, how many of them do you get a chance to actually get go through? Let me see. Care of the seven. None, none. I was figuring that. <laughs> yeah, uh, none. It, I mean, very. It's very, very difficult. It, it, it's hard because it's just time. I, you know, right. I'm, if you, I'm, I'm, dire- I'm directing on League of Legends, Fortnite, all of Blizzard stuff. I was doing Shadow of Mordor, Shadow of War. I did Mafia Three. Mafia Three was six months solid recording. You know, that was ninety five thousand lines of dialogue and over two hundred characters. So you're you're buried in production when you're doing mm-hmm. that. And often I'm working on those. At the moment, I'm rotating between Fortnite, Blizzard, and League of Legends. Uh, uh, and so it's I'm, I'm very, very fortunate and very lucky, but I have constant work. And then I'm trying to fit my own voiceover work in between that. Right, of um, course. You know, and I have, I have clients that I do stuff in the UK for. And, and so the problem with becoming successful is this, is that you've only got one voice. And so, you, you know, you're using it a lot, <laughs> and it gets turned very easily. So that's where all that technical training comes into place. But... 
having time to play games is is hard. Now I will. I have a PS4. It's mm -hmm. one of the best DVD players I've ever owned. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and 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 occasionally, occasionally, I will get a chance to have a little play. So I had a play through. Uh, Shadow of Mordor because that was the first one I directed and I was obviously bristling with pride at having mm -hmm. been asked to do that, and I really loved the orcs in those games. I just, mm -hmm. we, I, you know, we were responsible for putting those together, and I'm deeply proud of them. I mm -hmm. play about seventeen of the bastards, um, but but it, 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 the the great thing now is that if I'm uh, asked about a new project, I can go on YouTube. And I can check out the franchise. I can watch other people playing the game. Although, why people watch? The only I think the only person who's justified in watching other people play games is me, because <laughs> <laughs> I'm researching for other stuff. If I was a player, I mean, it would drive me nuts. Um, but uh, yeah, that, I mean, it, 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 I can go on and watch franchises and, and get, pick up the, the gist of the game and the way story is told, and that's really the, the main stuff I need to know. Yeah, uh, I I don't I do love playing games. I also know that if I really got into it, I probably would never emerge from my room ever again. Um, and, I, and I, I'm also it's a sucker for I'm a sucker for driving games. I love I love driving oh, yeah. games. Believe it or not, I like rally games and, and Formula One games and stuff like that as well. Have you done any of the voices of the cars? No, but I, I, I <laughs> stay tuned because that might be possible soon. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man! Uh, any projects you're allowed to talk about right now that maybe is on the horizon? Uh, I guess I have to specify announced. I mean, because obviously you're not going to tell me about anything that's not announced. No, I'm involved in something that's announced, but it, that's huge. But I don't think I can tell you that I'm involved. Uh -oh. um, I make my debut on a TV show on Sunday. Uh, uh -huh. A little show called Barry, which I'm joining the cast of. Barry. Yeah, which is Bill Hader's show, which is very, very mm -hmm. funny about an assassin who decides that his way of coming out of being an assassin is to be an actor because he stumbles across <laughs> an acting class. And uh, it's a very funny show, and I'm I'm joining that as a as a, a no ho Hanks Chechen boss who's coming to kill him. I think I roll up on Sunday night. Um, uh, what else can I? Is there anything else I can talk about? Really, it's awful. It's the worst question for a voice actor because we're not allowed to talk about anything. Right. I mean, I was I was outed as Kano in MK11 months before it came out, and oh really? I wrote to them and I said, "Can I talk about it now?" Because everyone knows it's me. Because <laughs> I think on IMDb it had been listed as Nolan, and uh, and they went, "Nope, you can't talk about it until it's on the shelf." So you know, people would be <laughs> Twitter messaging me, and I wouldn't reply. I therefore probably lost a lot of fans. Right. Or said, "I'm I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what you mean." But the fans know. They, they, the fans tell me I'm in games I didn't know I was in. <laughs> all the time. It happens all the time. I'm like, yeah, hey, oh, I think I remembered it. Because sometimes you just do one session and it's in the middle of a crazy week and you can't remember whether you did the game or not. Right, right. Um, so, yeah. There's that. That's awesome. So, I mean, I guess we should eventually bring it back to Caustic because, I mean, I brought you on here. Because you're you're Apex, and you were the Apex Legend Caustic. Um, I guess Indeed. what was what was their process for coming up with that character? What was your process as well? Yeah, I mean, I had I had a brief, and I auditioned for it. I had a brief that was written, and I I just um, you know I think over the years you build up certain instincts, and 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 I sort of you check those instincts by saying, okay, well, what if everyone else was going to do that take on the character? What, 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 how, what's my take on the character? What do I, how do I uniquely approach this character? Um, I had worked with these guys before and I think, um, you know, they were, they were fortunately fans of my work and you just go with your, you go with your instincts and what experience has taught you over the years. And I, and I, I came up with this very soft, very gentle killer, stone cold killer man mm -hmm. who has no heart who is um, very comfortable with death as a subject, uh. um, who uh, is a genius and um, fucking balls to the walls crazy. <laughs> um, but, you know, crazy doesn't have to be... <laughs> I don't have to be bonkers. I can be, I can be absolutely fucking crazy. Right. Um, and death is inevitable. Is I, mean, I want, I loved all the nihilism in it and, uh, and, and that very kind of... It's very Greek tragedy. Mm. In that it's like death is going to happen no matter what, and then when it does, I'll be here watching. Um, there are many ways out of a uh, out of a situation. Unfortunately, yours is is going to be dying, 
but it's just one way out of a situation. You don't have to worry. Um, <laughs> So there's a there's a wonderful I thought you know very a very subtle sense of sort of sense of humor in it that I I fell in love with immediately, uh -huh. um, and so you know we it's it's rare that you're just flat out asked to do a game. Um, it does happen, but but they always want to hear it and they always want right. to you know the, 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 there's a lot of you know historically game companies are are technical companies uh, and they've more and more over the years as as the quality and the bandwidth has has and the and the and the, the uh, ability of consoles has expanded you can do more performance you can have more you can peak up and you can have many more voices and you know um so how much to, of it was bring narrative sorry. much more into games sorry uh well i was going to say um how much of it was like your your making and how much of it was like their direction like when you first went into it were were you the one that came up with like the cool calculated character or is that how they wanted you to go again it's it? collaboration it's collaboration. yeah, yeah that, the, the the audition i don't think my audition was um i don't think i hit the, hit the nail slam on the head it's very very difficult to do that sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't but then you go into the studio um the the interesting thing is you don't know. You know very little about the character. I knew nothing about the character when I walked in. When I played uh, Bane in Arkham Origins, I didn't know what the game was. I didn't know what character I was playing. No one had given me any information at all. I barely remembered the audition. Um, and then we go in and you spend, you know, twenty minutes, half an hour figuring out the character. Or sometimes you spend two minutes figuring out the character. It just depends if they if you hit it. Um, we never get scripts. Very rarely do we get scripts before we walk in. And even when I'm directing a lot of the time, I don't get the scripts until I walk into the studio. So I have to figure. So it becomes about your mental alacrity and, and, and how uh, you can figure out what's going on very quickly. So that's great for auditioning because I'm doing my auditions either at midnight or two o'clock in the morning or at six in the, in the morning because mm -hmm. I have to go to work, because uh, especially when I'm directing. I don't know who you are and I don't care. Goodbye. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh for those of you watching black and white my phone just went off um the uh so 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 it's it's collaboration and i said what do you mean do you mean a little like this and i'll read a line they're like yeah yeah that's good what about if we what if we what what, what if he got angry where, where would that go i'll try a line like that and uh, oh i see okay and 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 uh see let's see how quiet you go uh, okay interesting keep that tone uh but just harden the topic and i do it as a director myself you know we find the voice together uh in in World of Warcraft, that could be run a big giant orc, or it could be a crazy Scottish dwarf, uh, or it could be an elf that's very clean and very quiet. Um, you know, so there's, there's a lot of variety of stuff, and you're pulling from a lot of experience and a lot of different places you've gone, but always trying to find something that's unique to that character. Uh -huh. And I think, you know, getting the image, looking at the image, um, I love the concept of quietly fucking crazy i mean i right. love that kind of complete lunatic but never because evil characters is she behaving herself i think so evil characters as long as she's not watching friggin caillou um evil characters evil characters don't know that they're evil you can't play evil yeah. they're just they're they're people who as far as they're concerned they're just misunderstood they're very much like toddlers if I don't like the carrot puree that you put in my mouth, I'm just going to spit it out violently because that's my way of dealing it. <laughs> uh, it doesn't make them bad. They're just, you know, your kitchen is covered in carrot puree, but the kid was just reacting to what, um, what they were, they were, uh, uh, you know, the, their in, initial instincts. My doorbell has just gone. Okay. Um, can I find out who it is? Yeah, go for it. Hold on a second. Oh, it's UPS. I'll be right back. Okay. Sorry about that. I had to sign for it. Apologies. No, it's all right. <laughs> not really in the middle of an interview. Eh, I'm I'm not professional. I like <laughs> to think I like to think I am, and maybe one day I'll be there. But you know, you and me not, both, mate. Not, not today. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I have yeah, I have my kid in the other room. At any moment, she could just be like, "Dad, I need to go potty." Yeah, and I'll just have to be like, "Okay, hold on, just a second. I'll be right back." I remember those days. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, that stops. <laughs> <laughs> eventually, eventually, but like right now, like she's still she's very tiny. She's very tiny. She was a preemie, 
And right. so she's still like the in the one percentile. So she's still very tiny. So still getting up on the toilet is like she needs a stool and everything. So yeah, it's it's adorable. I I still love it. Um, oh, I really enjoyed running up those stairs. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think we've gotten through a lot you know now let's talk uh what we we're talking about let's get back on track back on track all right yes, this is very now. serious stop misbehaving yes um asked you about caustic um i mean that's it you've run out that's it I've, I've, i think I've, I've run out of things to talk about <laughs> you know um let me check something really fast <laughs> um so i'm looking at my my discord just to see um some of the questions like you've already gone over like how you got into voice acting and luck uh, question i don't know what that means mav cop doing some research want to try and ask him a trap question i don't understand what that okay, means okay well ask oh, there's a link i'm not going to click on the link i'm trying to do no. something mav cop yeah. jesus just ask the question dude <laughs> Well, honestly, I told them, I told them, give me something funny for you to say in the caustic voice, and not a single one of them have actually. Oh, come on, people! You can do better than that. I mean, uh, a lot of them are just praising me. I mean, oh, well, great, you got a big do. person on. Good for you. And um, yeah, I don't know. That's. What's what's a good way to like sign you off and everything? <laughs> you know, one thing I would like you to do, um, uh -huh. with your permission, what I'd like you to do is to uh, to read something for me, and then we can use that as like the intro. Sure. The intro. Okay. Um, do you want to do email or whatever? Uh, if you click, if you go onto the chat. The chat. You see Google Hangouts top yeah. left hand corner, the blue thing. That's I'm in the, the chat. chat. Okay, let I'm me. In the, ch the chat has been achieved. All right, so let me get it for you. I have it on my other screen, so it's like I'm trying to look at it. Yeah, stop talking about how fancy you are with all your screens. I just have the one because that's all I can manage. You're clearly a better person than I am. That's the first step of admitting you have a problem. <laughs> Touche. How many problems am I allowed to admit at once? <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> that'll start to cost you. Oh, yeah. Oops. Did I what what just happened? Nothing. Dang it. I got rid of it apparently. <laughs> ah, hello. This is oh there is I've got it. Oh, okay, hold on. Um that was only part of it. Now Yeah, no, get me the rest. <laughs> You're handling the technology, are you, Basil? Okay, there we go. So I was thinking, say the first part in just your regular voice, and then if you wouldn't mind switching to caustic for the second part, the part where cool. you know you're listening to do 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 do. All righty. Hello, this is JB Blunk, and I voice caustic in Apex Legends, and you're listening to Apex Legends Hubcast, your stop for everything. Apex. Nice. <laughs> Yay. That would be. Oh, that's good. 
<laughs> I mean, should I be more of a director? It's like, okay, let's let's, let's yeah. do the second part again. But what I want you to have is a is a sort of indifference to it all. <laughs> and you're listening to Apex Legends, Apex Legends Hubcast. Your stop for everything, Apex. <laughs> Uh, and now you're a uh, crazy Scotsman. <laughs> and you're listening to Apex Legends. I'm cast. You're stop for everything, Apex. You know what I mean? <laughs> My Josh Duck. There we go. <laughs> All right. Oh, man. I mean, I don't know. Anything you want to talk about? <laughs> I, I, honestly, I just don't think there's anything uh, anything interesting to say anymore. I just, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm an empty vessel. You've gutted me. No, I actually have to get up because I've got a lot of auditions I have to lay down by noon. Oh, um, but but uh, I, it's been really fun, man. Thank you. A very, yeah, very you nice, easy, me. personal. I, I definitely appreciate it. You know, um, My you know pleasure. We're, we're still we're still pretty small. Apex Hubcast is actually like one of our very first like big projects that we've had um we've been doing this for about three years and so you know having one of my big my, one of my first big voice actors be a part of kind of what got me going is you know it means a lot to me so thank you very much i'm very happy man I'm, and i'm flattered that you chose me so i appreciate it thank you yeah all right well you have yourself a good day then thanks man take it easy see you, everyone bye, bye.